and I'd like to welcome Prof. John Patrick. He studied medicine at King's College in London and St. George's Hospital uh, in, uh, in London as well in the UK. He's held many appointments in Britain, the West Indies and Canada. And his main academic interest has been medicine, in medicine has been the treatment of protein energy malnutrition in various diseases, accident, trauma throughout the world. He's carried out research in the UK, Jamaica, Canada, and Africa. And in the 70s, he worked at the University of West Indies in Jamaica and was involved in the breakthrough of protein energy malnutrition treatment whilst in Jamaica. He came to Canada in 1980 at the University of Ottawa. John is an associate professor in clinical nutrition in the Department of Biochemistry and Pediatrics for the past 20 years. He's concerned to understand the link between the treatment of the severely malnourished, their beliefs and their culture. Today, John speaks to Christian and secular groups around the world, communicating effectively on medical ethics, culture, public policy, and the integration of faith and science. He frequently speaks to us with, um, uh, as uh, our family members in the US through the Christian Medical and Dental Association, as well as in Canada. He is currently president and professor of the history of science, medicine, and faith at Augustine College in Canada. John and his wife, Sally, manage the Hippocratic Registry of Physicians whose focus is the practice of medicine as a moral activity requiring authority beyond themselves, an absolute commitment to the sanctity of life and freedom of conscience for physicians. John and Sally have four grown children and 21 grandchildren. Their oldest daughter and family are missionaries in the country I'm speaking from, Malawi, and you know, that's in Southern Africa. And their other children are still in Canada, based in Ottawa. And they all are in different denominational churches and are very active in their faith. With that, without further ado, we pray that we will open our hearts, but also open our spiritual ears and eyes so that we can hear what God is speaking to us through Prof. John Patrick. I was delighted when Augustine invited me to speak to this conference and the title, When is Enough is Enough, was a lovely one. Uh, so thank you very much for that start. I should say at this point that the book that's had most impact on what I'm about to say is Confronted by Grace by uh, John Webster. And if you haven't read that book, I urge you to get it. It's one of the best practical theology books I've ever had in my hand, and I'm reading it slowly for the second time at the moment. But back to our subject, when is enough enough? Uh, underlying that is the question of where do we find our satisfaction? And I would go right back to Deuteronomy, where when the law was given to the Jews, God said, oh, that they should always have such a heart and mind as this one that was given to obedience that it might go well with them and their children forever uh, there's a very clear statement of true satisfaction enough is enough uh, when you are obedient to god that's what we have to discuss uh, in john 17 jesus said i am come that they might know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent uh, so knowing God is going to be the heart of any serious interaction with the idea of what should characterize our lives. It's not an accident that Princess Diana and Mother Teresa died at almost the same time. One had all the fame and money and everything you could imagine and appeared to spend her life searching for meaning and satisfaction. 
Mother Teresa could put all her possessions in a bucket. She loved Jesus and she was satisfied. She had enough. So the aim of a Christian's life must be to know God more and more. And it's very interesting, uh, someone like Aquinas at the end of his life, having achieved the, the greatest intellectual feat in a few centuries, had a, a, a vision of Jesus in the chapel. And Jesus said to him, it is well done, Thomas, what do you wish? And a, a monk who was there didn't see the vision, but heard the conversation. Thomas said, only you, O Lord. And he never wrote another word after that. He never finished the Summa. When asked why, he said, it's all straw. I find that absolutely fascinating. It doesn't matter how important we think we are or how great what we've done is. In comparison with one sentence with Jesus, Thomas said, oh, it's straw. Heaven and the heavenly is something beyond our comprehension. But that at least gives us an idea of where real satisfaction is to be found. The Americans, of course, say that in their, their uh, documents that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is what they're about. Uh, one of their wiser presidents, perhaps the most wise, John Adams, said that our constitution is for a religious people. It is wholly unsuited to any other. They're discovering at the moment that just under half the population wants to get rid of the Constitution because they are not a religious people anymore. But the majority of Americans still are, even those that voted for uh, Biden. Many of them are probably regretting it a little bit now. Uh, many of us uh, on the more small-c conservative side were appalled at uh, Trump's manners on occasions, but uh, do what Jesus said, judge them by their works, what actually happens. But that's not what we're here to talk about at the moment. Satisfaction, enough is enough. The first thing we need to do is to define how we're going to talk about this. And I would suggest to you that we can talk about satisfaction in at least four layers. The first one is the obvious one that you deal with very often in your practice, and that's the purely practical one, uh, the satisfactions that we share with the animals. We need food, we need water, uh, we need a community of some sort, um, and we have a sexual drive. These are all animal happinesses, if you like, uh, and the animals don't abuse them. The difference between us and the animals is that if we behave as though we're animals, those satisfactions cease to be satisfying. So if food becomes central to your life, you'll end up obese. It's not good for you. If sex rather than love is central to your life, you won't have any relationships. And so it goes on. So happiness can convert into an unhappiness when we abuse it. Now, that leads to the, the next level. OK, what makes us different from the animals? And I would put it to you that what makes us different from the animals is abstract thought, uh, ethics. Uh, there's no ethical behavior amongst animals. There are only reflexes and instincts. But we make choices in the ways that animals don't. Uh, we find satisfactions in abstract things. Nobody has ever measured love. It can't be reduced to a measurement, but we all know when we found it and we want it. Um, we go to school thinking that the education we'll get will, will make us satisfied, content. We will have enough. Well, in material terms, that may be true, but you all know perfectly well that you don't lie back in clouds of glory and a bed of roses. Uh, no, uh, the first thing you discover when you go to university, it's highly competitive. Uh, in North America, incredibly uh, competitive. From day one, you're struggling for the best residency positions, and so it goes on. So what Socrates and Plato wanted to be a learning experience where we got wiser every day turns into a neurosis-inducing experience where every medical school has to have a prof who's like a Catholic priest. You can go to him and say the stress is so much 
uh, I'm drinking <laughs> drugs and mind this sex. I need help. And you'll get it and it won't appear on your uh, transcript because by the time you've been in medical school for six weeks, you've already so much money on you. We, we need to make some kind of physician out of you. Uh, this is not satisfaction, is it? That's, that's not the way to live. Then you, you move up the next level, which is you start to, to think more seriously about what it means to be human. Um, the best thing I ever did with medical students taken as a, a group was over the years took about 30 or more to Africa with me and my wife Sally. And uh, what we did was dump them in a village six weeks, six, <laughs> dump them in a village for six weeks, uh, a couple of days walk from anywhere. Uh, and they had to find and resuscitate two malnourished children and do a health survey of the village. Uh, I would visit them once during the, the process to see they were surviving. Without exception, they all said it was an incredible experience. They, they were very glad they'd done it. Some said immediately, I will never do anything like this again because no running water, no electricity, a mud hut for a place to sleep and a pit latrine uh, wasn't their idea of a holiday. Um, but for their character, it was excellent. They, they went there because they wanted to see the developing world and they wanted to be helpful and they, they were helpful. And that's satisfying. Uh, people find when they marry and children come along that those children capture their hearts and minds in all normal human beings uh, and give them a degree of satisfaction uh, that is much more satisfying than anything they've had before. As we move up the layers, uh, if you think of the satisfaction as a graph, it's a spike at the bottom and it flattens out so that by the time you get to this level of, of wanting to serve your family and your patients and your church, that's, that's an ongoing background to your life. And the last one, of course, is, is knowing God, which many people never get to until the last six weeks of their lives. And that, as I hope most of you know, it becomes like a deep undercurrent to your life, a, a certainty that uh, you're going in the right direction. Uh, that's important and amazing. So with those, with that network of definitions behind us, what is a good life, a satisfying life going to look like for a physician? What does Jesus have to say about it? Well, it's very interesting. He has a lot to say about it, and there's no way I can talk about it all by any stretch of the imagination. For me, uh, the guiding light has been the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm not going to talk about that today, although it's at the back of this talk. And if you're interested, you can find it on my website. Um, over the 20 years or so, that, or more than that, that I've been doing this kind of thing, uh, the most beautiful and frequent responses are to the Sermon on the Mount talk, because what that is is about the difference between a mere believer who looks upon salvation basically as a kind of divine insurance policy that you keep in the drawer and hope to get out towards the end of your life. And what Jesus wants is for you to be on the way throughout your life to become a disciple. That means to become obedient. And in the process, he will teach you that you're, you really are a major problem to yourself and to everyone else. That's the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. If I could all pro provide you all now with a bubble over your head for the next week and every one of your thoughts was on display, that would not be good news, would it? We're all screwed up. That's what Jesus says. Uh, he's totally opposed to the modern self-help books. Basically, he says, blessed are you uh, when you realize you're a total mess and you're screwed up. Uh, the kingdom is yours. <laughs> because because you become honest and um, God's kingdom is always built on truth. And the truth is, as Jesus puts it in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. And the Sermon on the Mount, basically the Beatitudes are the character formation that you need to go through every day. And then the rest of the sermon is uh, working out of that in the context of particular problems. And I, I must leave it at that for, for this particular talk. But take up your cross and follow me, is what Jesus said. I mean, 
the crucifixion, which is coming up uh, in the church year, uh, almost within a week or so, was, was a triumph, not a disaster. Paul uses it where he says he triumphed over the principalities and powers. We don't understand what goes on in that process, but we all know the real satisfaction of completing a really worthwhile job. And Jesus had completed the most important project for human humanity when he cried out, it is finished. The job done, completed. Um, if we don't enter into that in a very personal way, uh, we're missing out on important things. Now, one of the things that happens to us as physicians is we use busyness to avoid thinking. And that's very easy to do as a doctor. You can spend your whole life being busy about other people's needs. And that would be wonderful, but it, it's not sufficient. Uh, in the end, you retire. And that's then what, then what you do. If your life is built entirely on that busyness, the, the end of your life comes along and you don't know what to do with yourself. So um, smart people have realized that this is a problem for a long while. I love the line from Gray's Elegy where he says, let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys. Uh, you don't go into medicine if you're not ambitious in some way, but ambition mustn't be allowed to mock. Uh, we are still servants of the Lord and ambition will mock especially if you push for things which you are not made for. I always say, for instance, that no one should ever apply to be a professor. You should be asked to apply because then people are saying to you, we know you can do this. Um, there are people who want to be professors. That's a silly thing to want to be. God makes a few people to be professors because we're a bit of a pain, uh, but he makes us with it the capacities to do what's necessary like giving lectures is not a problem for a professor somebody who goes into it to for reasons of ego is going to have a miserable time because it they're not made for that job and the important thing is that we should all have a job that leaves us able to live with the sabbath and have time with family and friends and church and all the rest and if we're constantly neurotic about what we do, we should change your job. Let not ambition mock. Ambition is not the way to enough. It's a way to neurosis. Uh, Jesus says, look, there are plenty of people around you, not just patients, the poor you have always with you. There are plenty of projects, but you don't live for projects. Now, I think one of the reasons that I was asked to give this talk is because of the way the prosperity gospel has damaged the church in Africa, in my view. It's an appalling concept. You won't find it anywhere in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus actually says, take up your cross and follow me. Uh, that's no easy uh, metaphor at all. Sorry, I, my screen is playing games with me. I hope it isn't with you. Uh, we'll see. Being, oh, gee. Sorry about that. Um, being a disciple is the most satisfying thing that can happen to you, uh, but it's not an easy ride, but it teaches you your real dependency on Christ, and that's what it's about. I, I would certainly strongly recommend to you that you read Bonhoeffer's little book, Life Together, with the group with whom you worship at least once a year. It will remind you of what actually needs to be central in your life. Um, and it, it can't be you. you know, we have so many over inflated egos in the university today, often not attached to real talent, but it's a disaster zone. Um, if you can't read Romans 5, we rejoice in suffering, knowing that it, in, in just, it produces endurance and character and hope. In Africa, you have plenty of experience of that. And hopefully you all know people who are not rich and will never be famous, but they do actually know God. 
and they are content. They have enough. Um, that can be very upsetting to those of us who are more concerned about whether we can actually pay the mortgage on a car we shouldn't have bought in the first place or other goodies that we bought that we shouldn't have bought in the first place. It's a standard uh, problem for young doctors is that they get into debt very quickly. As a Christian, you shouldn't do that. I mean, it's interesting that people who don't practice the Christian faith often see this more clearly than than we do. Uh, I, for many years, had in my uh, pocketbook uh, a, a quotation from Steinbeck writing to Adlai Stevenson, who was a very liberal secretary of state in the American government. And he wrote this, mainly, my dear Adlai, I am perturbed by the cynical immorality of our nation. And this was written, you know, 50 years ago. He said, if I wanted to destroy a nation, I would make it rich and powerful and self-interested. Strange creatures we are. We can, we can handle all that God and nature may send upon us, save only plenty. That will destroy us. It's, it's incredibly true. So what do we do? It requires a much deeper theology than we have been practicing. My development dream for Africa would be to get a good uh, commentary on Deuteronomy into the hands of every African pastor. And I would add to that, uh, that little book I'm reading at the moment, uh, uh, Confronted by Grace by David. John Webster, who was professor in Oxford, but didn't like the people in Oxford, professor of theology, went to Aberdeen, ended up in uh, St. Andrews and took half his life learning that his real job was to make the scriptures clear. And he did that very well uh, and died sadly young. I mean, mission accomplished, I presume. Um, those two resources, a good commentary on Deuteronomy and uh, John Webster's Confronted by Grace, perhaps added to by New Begin's foolishness to the Greeks. If you think about those carefully, uh, you will avoid a lot of the problems that are standard. Unfortunately, secular education does lead your faith astray or doesn't nourish it anyway. It, look, it's commonplace that people say, well, for 20 years, I really wasn't a serious Christian. That was certainly true of me, only sadly it was more than 20 years. Um, that can be avoided if we have better training, but when was the last time you went to church and listened to a sermon that really hit you between the eyes and you couldn't get it out of your mind until you changed your life in some way? That's what we need. Um, so the first thing that... I want to say that comes directly from John Webster, and I found it so neatly explained and so satisfying. Um, it's always been a problem for me to talk to people about conversion uh, because I'm inadequate to the job. I think everybody is. Uh, what I do in uh, secular settings now, every now and again, I'll get a chance when I... I'm giving a lecture on some aspect of faith in a university and somebody turns up who knew me when I was a trendy scientist. And they'll come and say to me after the lecture that, uh, uh, hello or whatever, and if they're British, they'll be rude. And basically they'll say, yeah, I used to read your stuff until the early mid nineties. But I said, oh, you think I lost my mind in the mid nineties. And they said, well, you write rubbish now, don't you? <laughs> I say, well, I think I'll prove you're wrong about that. Uh, when someone loses their mind, what do they become? And, of course, they have to say crazy and mad. Well, I haven't become crazy and mad. I've become more satisfied, not less satisfied. And even my wife would acknowledge things got better rather than worse. So you misunderstood. You think that your way of understanding the world is capable of understanding everything that matters, but it's not. My faith is not irrational, which is what you need to believe for your position, so much as super rational. I have been gifted by Christ coming to me 
and changing the way I see the world. And I am more content, more at ease, more satisfied, serving more people. Your world can't answer the big questions. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Am I created or am I an accident, etc., etc. And we've been teaching in school that we're a result of a colossal accident for a long while. And now we're complaining that young people behave as though that's true. But we're not colossal accidents. And deep down, we know. That's why Jordan Peterson is so popular. He talks about meaning and meaning matters, especially to the younger generation. So uh, I would go on to say to uh, an acquaintance like that, I can't tell you about my faith in the way that you would like it to be taught to because it can't be reduced to that. All I can tell you is if you seek, you will find. And depending on how arrogant you are, it will take longer or shorter times. John Wesley took 10 years. He was arrogant. I took even longer. Draw your own conclusion. But it is about reality. And the way you know that is by looking around at the lives of people who claim that this has happened to them. Now, the first thing I would like to change in the evangelical mode of operation these days, uh, particularly in the, the more uh, unthinking end of the spectrum, is to stop saying, stop playing the world's game. If you try and present your understanding of salvation in reduced terms that can be acceptable to a modern scientist of the scientism variety, you'll, you'll get nowhere. You do much better to say, I can't do that. But I can tell you where to find examples of people whose lives have changed and undeniably changed. Paul would be the classic example, probably the most brilliant man that ever lived, who certainly changed the world as much as anyone after Christ. Um, and he says, I count everything as done compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ. He wasn't, he wasn't foolish. Uh, do we begin to be able to relate to that? Um, we need to, and we can. And what John Webster points out, he, he goes to Hebrews 11, where else would you go, uh, the chapter on faith? And he doesn't say, do you believe in God? Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Have you confessed your sins? Have you asked Jesus into your life? Sign here. That's not in Hebrews 11, is it? Quite, quite differently. It's about faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. That's a bit ambiguous, a little hard to deal with. But it, but it actually is truthful. And the more you think about it, the stronger it gets. We know with a remarkable certainty, if we've been blessed with the real conversion, that something important happened, even though we cannot describe it. We also know that we haven't seen God. In fact, Moses was told no man can see God and live. So we have to allow God to be God. and we, He's not going to do it our way because he knows what he's about. Now, we do get to know him, of course. Uh, he makes himself known. And, and you see it happening in people. It's happening to Jordan Peterson at the moment. Where he says, I find myself almost believing that I'm a Christian, but he doesn't know how it's happening. Uh, uh, in the book, Professors Who Believe, you'll find about 22 of us who were bullied into writing about this phenomenon. And I was delighted that all except one of them do it exactly that way. They, they give accounts that are not explanatory. They tell you something about what was going on at the time. They tell you how you, the way you looked at the world changed. But nobody understands how Christ brings us into his kingdom. We know when we're on the, on the way, uh, and it, it grows. So the second half of that statement in, in Hebrews, the conviction of things that we cannot see. One of the amazing things about Christians is we're sure of things we can't see. And the place to find the best witnesses to that, of course, are the martyrs. The martyrs almost invariably died well because they were seeing where they were going. Always be present at the death of Christians, especially children, if you can, because children in particular will give you 
insights into what is happening. There's a lovely example in Diane Comp's little book, uh, Window on Heaven, where the child who brought her uh, back to thinking about faith, dying of leukemia in a Christian family, woke up just before she died and said, Mommy, can you see the angels? Can you hear their singing? It's beautiful. And she was gone. She didn't have any problem about, about dying. She just wanted to get to where, where she could see she was going. And these things are around us, if we will, but look, uh, take, take time to, to think about what's happening to you when, when something with real emotional content and intellectual content comes your way. Grab it with both hands and then remember to remember it. Don't try and recreate the feeling. You can't do that, but you can remember what happened. David, in a particularly black patch, says, uh, everything's miserable, but I do remember going into the house of the Lord with rejoicing. Maybe I will do it again. Um, you and I were brought up in our training. Within weeks of getting to medical school, I was a reductionist without the word being used and without me knowing what had been done. We become show-me people, don't we? Uh, we talk about evidence-based medicine without any discussion of what it actually means. For most people, evidence-based medicine is pure authority. Unless you can read the methods section of the critical papers, you're not an expert, so you are dependent upon other people. COVID is showing us that as Data is manipulated and badly used, and most people can't even see the ways in which it's being badly used, nor are they able to put it into a bigger uh, framework to understand it. Uh, we like knockdown arguments, don't we? We like apologetics conferences, but very few people are brought to faith by apologetics conferences. They remove some barriers to faith, but the actual coming to faith is something that only God can do. Um, we do not change minds. Uh, if, if things change minds, then they would be God. But God is God. Anything that takes away from putting God first is an idol. Religion can be an idol. Beautiful services can be an idol. Uh, medicine can be an idol. Anything that displaces God from the central position in our lives, we must come to God on God's terms. And he says... Now, as Paul puts it, now we see through a glass darkly. We, we only have vague intimations of much of, it, of what is to happen, but it's enough. Because we, ne we know we're not on our, our own. We're held in the hands of God. We can trust God. Objective and subjective changes at this point. Uh, people who do science say, I want objective truth, things that they can touch and feel, etc. right back to Ockham. Uh, but everything that comes to us from God is more objective than anything else because our objective science is usually proved to be wrong in a few years' time. Uh, it's provisional, and then we build a better model. Uh, but we never have to change anything about God. Uh, we just know more, and it all fits together. So that's pure objectivity. You can't get to a better source of objectivity than God who made the whole thing. And the whole thing is dependent upon him. Without me, you can do nothing. By whom all things consist. It's an amazing statement, but that's objectivity. And our faith is rooted in that kind of objectivity. And our subjectivity it can help or get in the way, whatever. You all know about that, but it's not something to be trusted. What you can trust is the stories of what God did and the story of what he has done in you and in your family. We are convinced that because God is a promise keeper, we can be certain of things we cannot see. Like the fact that we go to a kingdom, a city whose builder and maker is God. Um, Because we haven't got over our training in medicine, we haven't integrated the practicalities of doing medicine as well as we can, with the recognition of the fact that evidence-based medicine is authority and therefore we need to know about the character of the people we're trusting. I used to say to graduate students, the only reason for going to a meeting where you're looking at posters is 
uh, to talk to the people there to see if you can find out what kind of people they are, because we know there are only about one in six posters to make it to publication. And we've no idea now how much cheating there is in things that do get published. Uh, this is undermining medicine very dramatically. The bottom line, material things like your car, your house, your clothes, whatever, are transient. But knowing him so far through a glass darkly is enough for now and filled with promise of a glorious future. Enough only in Christ. Everything else will fail. I hope this is helpful. I hope to hear from you. John Patrick, uh, John Sally Patrick at gmail.com is a email address, and uh, John Patrick.ca is my website. Blessings on you all. Thank you very much, Prof. John Patrick. Um, we've been challenged in our lives to engage with God, allow God to write our story. We love writing our story as health care workers, and especially as doctors, as we've said, we are very ambitious. But are we willing to allow God to write the story for us? I always remember the Proverbs 3, verse 6, which says, um, you need um, seek God in all you do, and he shall give you which path in which you shall go or walk. Let's remember that as we were reflecting on the deep um, reflection that we had from uh, Prof. John Patrick.